Good afternoon. I'm Amy Button Renz, President and CEO of the K State Alumni Association, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today for our fourth Wildcat Chat. And you're in for a treat uh, because we have 2008 graduate Taylor Bratt, and he is simply amazing. And I want to share a little bit about my connection to him, um, but we share a love of not only K State athletics, but in particular K State football. And my grandfather actually played football for K-State, played in Memorial Stadium, and actually scored the very first touchdown in Memorial Stadium back in the 1920s. Um, I also have ties to Taylor because my son-in-law, Greg Gaskins, played for K-State um, at the, about the same time that uh, Taylor first started at K-State. And uh, I will never forget our catbacker trip to Garden City. The plane was canceled to go to Dodge City, and so we could not get to the event last spring. And so had the idea, maybe Taylor and I could go together. And uh, it, a lot of people couldn't believe we were traveling together, but we had a great time. The only condition was he had to drive. But one other thing that we have in common is we both, I have a purple Buick, he has a purple Jeep. His Jeep's a lot cooler than my purple Buick. But we had a great time and really got well acquainted and, um, I just know that you're uh, really going to enjoy this special ses session. He's just entered his 15th year at Kansas State and his eighth year as the director of football recruiting. He came to K-State as a student assistant coach back in 2006, and he was working with the defense and special teams, and he continues to help those areas as a quality control assistant. Uh, he was born and raised in Wichita, Kansas. Uh, he graduated from Wichita Heights High School in 2003 and went through spring practices at Butler before beginning his coaching career. Uh, he's married to his fabulous wife, Leah, and his two amazing daughters, Brittany and Delaney, and they have a third one on the way. And I hope he shares a little bit about his family. His daughters might love purple almost as much as he does. Um, but without um, further ado, I want us to uh, really have a fun time today. We have a lot of questions. You certainly can uh, send questions into the chat. And we're gonna really talk about Taylor's love of K-State and his position as director of football recruiting. We're not gonna talk, talk about the football schedule right now. I think if you need information, um, you certainly can call uh, the ticket office and there, Jean Taylor's done a phenomenal job uh, outlining how it's all going to work. And I think we're all just relieved that we know K-State football is uh, coming down um, the path uh, in the middle of September. So uh, what we'd like to do is have Taylor spend a little bit of time talking about um, himself and uh, all things purple. And then we'll ask a few questions, but Taylor, awesome. thank you so much and go Cats. <laughs> thank you, go Cats. That's a honor and a privilege to be on here. I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to share my love uh, for K-State and for this great state of Kansas. Um, you know, this is my home. This is everything to me. Uh, my wife's also an alum. We were married on campus. My wedding ring's purple. I know you got a purple Buick, Amy, but I also got a purple moped. So I had to double down on you on that one. So uh, my, my daughters definitely cheer K-State around the house all day. I think when we text about the ride down the garden, you didn't have my number. So I just texted you a video of both my daughters jumping around the living room, singing the chants and the, the song. And I was waiting for the response of who is this? And I got that. And I said, well, it's the wild man of K-State. So uh, I hope that you're a uh, willing to share your vehicle with me to take me down there to the catbacker events, which uh, it was sad not to attend those this year because those are definitely special events with special people and just a great way to get around this amazing community and the graduates at the school. Um, I spent a lot of time up here and I spent a lot of time in things in purple. I think my hardest decision is what vehicle will I take to work, um, <laughs> it, which is a good, it's a good struggle to have. I love every minute of it. It's not really work for me, it's fun. I, I kind of get paid for what I wouldn't say got me in trouble, but what kept me wild and rambunctious is being loud and obnoxious. And now I kind of get to do that every day and yell go cats quite often and probably more than what most would want to hear. But it's it's a privilege and it's a blessing to be able to do this. My uh, great grandfather went to K State in 1917. Um, and so before getting drafted off to the war. So this is definitely home being a fourth generation Kansas kid. I love sharing my expression and love for the university and for the school. Um, sorry, I apologize for my 
goofy hat. I got my COVID hair going on. This is my ugly sweater hat on one side and my summer feel on the back. But uh, I was going to put on this today, but I didn't know if you guys needed me to run out of the tunnel or whatnot, but I, I came prepared to play today. So uh, this is kind of a game day for me. I spent a lot of time on Zoom calls with prospects, and I make sure I throw on the helmet once in a while with them on there and get some good laughter from their families and the, on, and the young kids that we're recruiting. Um, I'm excited to be here and excited to answer your questions and make sure you have some good ones because I'll, I'll probably have some good and at least some entertaining answers, and I'll try not to make everybody go deaf by yelling go cats not too many times. So I think the guys that set this up, I yelled that a couple of times at them when we first got on. But uh, I'm excited to be here, Amy. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you so much. And I think um, maybe the first question should be, how's recruiting going in this pandemic? <laughs> and as high schools counsel or move sports to the spring, how's that going to impact recruiting? Uh, recruiting is definitely different than it's ever been before. I mean, the, our best sell is the community, the school, the atmosphere, guys being here, one-on-ones uh, -on -ones with the kids when they're here. I will call them kids because they're still in high school. And I technically consider myself probably still a kid too. So, and that was a joke. I hope everybody's laughing at home. Um, but it's definitely been Zooms, Twitter, Snapchat, uh, FaceTimes. We're living life through, like everybody else, fighting the struggles, trying to figure out a way to get better, trying to answer the call to adapting to this new normal that we're living in. I know when the first, the pandemic hit, me and Coach Kleiman every Tuesday, I think it was March through or it was maybe it was April through May, every Tuesday night we came here and FaceTimed 10 kids at night from about 7 o'clock to 10 o'clock. And then on Wednesday, I would meet an offensive coach here, and we do the same thing on offense. We would Zoom about 10 kids from 7 o'clock to 9 o'clock. Then Thursday night, I would meet with the defensive coach and do the same. So the hardest part is developing that relationship right now. Um, you don't really – it's hard to know the kids too. When kids come to visit, you get to shake their hand, you get to be around them, really get a feel for them and make sure they're a good fit for you and vice versa. So we're, we're trying to find a way. And then with those Zooms, what we kind of had a laid out plan is each week we would show them something new. So week one, we would show that we would do it on the field under the stadium lights. Uh, week two, we would be in the weight room and then we would show the academic center. Week three, we would show them Jardine Apartments and the Players Lounge. So we try to mold it to where it kept kids dragging along wanting to see what was next see more see more see more so you didn't show them all at once and then they they weren't interested but we're learning and adapting and it'll be more interesting when uh things actually get opened up when kids can visit because right now we can't have them on campus and when they'll play you know i feel really bad for those underclassmen that needed a camp to get a look or to get an offer at any school and that didn't happen this summer with no camps. And that's a tremendous recruiting tool for us. Um, and just being here. I mean, we had, uh, we moved our junior days. Usually we do them early. We, in February, we moved them to April, March. That way when guys came here, they could actually see a practice. And we thought that'd be more important. And when that got canceled, you know, that hurt. So we're just trying to keep plugging along, recruit the Midwest great. Uh, recruit the out-of-state regions that we hit hard and get the right kids for the program that we're trying to build. Well, this isn't a recruiting question, but when we were on the Catbacker tour, I noticed what a rapport you had with all the players. And uh, when they would talk about things, when Wyatt was interviewing them, I mean, I think you're one of their favorite personalities um, and coaches. So uh, maybe talk a little bit about your relationship with our current players. Uh, they are, I, I don't know if I'm their brother or like a parent to them. I don't know. Um, but they're the reason why it all works. They need to be happy with the decision they made and their time here. I want them all to leave here with a great experience. Even if a guy's here for six years or one year, uh, even if a kid isn't good enough to play here, I want him to leave feeling like K-State was special. I mean, you just never know. And it's special to me and I want them to feel that. And so I try to have fun. We have a great time. Um, we try to, I try to do special things with them and for them and develop. And each, each guy here I have a different relationship with because there's something about them that I know. I mean, I've been talking to the majority of these guys since they were in junior and in high school. And it's just something you build up over time that you have. And uh, I treasure that. And I, with past players being invited to their weddings, uh, being there when they announce that they're having a little one, you know, getting the text, um, that's what it's about. And having a great experience when they come back to visit. 
you know, showing them, hey, look how special you helped create this place. You kept this thing going too. I mean, this is definitely not a me, me, me. This is a group of guys that you bring here and you try to get them all convinced to do one thing. And that's to be great and to represent their school, their brand well too. Do you have a favorite recruiting story of somebody that you landed that uh, you can share with us? I mean, I always kind of go back to Travis Tannehill to, just to make sure I keep it PG. But um, Travis's dad, we're touring around campus and uh, Travis's dad's like, we're, I'm driving around showing this building, this building, this building. I said, like, hey, let's go check out the library. The library just got redone. Let's go check it out. And Travis's dad goes, hold on, hold on. What's in the library? I said, you know, books, computers, you know, all that stuff. He goes, no, I've been in one library before. Once you've been in one, you've been in them all. So let's head back up there and talk ball. I said, yes, let's do that. So uh, every recruiting trip is different. Dalton Reisner's family was awesome. Uh, we had an amazing time out in Aggieville. We won't go into details, but it was a lot of fun. And each each guy that visits, you again, you develop that relationship with them and their families. And every one of them has a fun story or a unique story or something one they did while they were here that was funny that you can give them a hard time about. But gosh, there's too there'd be too many stories. Fifteen years, I don't know all of them off the top of my head. There's there would be a lot. Well, maybe going back to potential recruits, how often are you in contact with them and um, and how do you actually reach out to them? And I mean, I know it may be a little bit different right now. A uh, majority of my stuff is through Snapchat. I try to adapt to the youngest way. I, I play video games with them, uh, Twitter, uh, again, Zoom, but majority of it's Snapchat. After uh, we get a guy committed, you know, I, I throw them in a group Snapchat group and I have all the commits in there. That way they can start building a relationship with each other and I can kind of be involved in that too. And I had that, we call it email after the year. So right now I'm on email 21 with guys in there. Then I have email all the way back to email 17 with, with all the guys we signed all in there. And just being around them and while they're here, it's kind of cool too, because you're still in the group, seeing what they're saying, how they're doing, you know, it really keeps you involved with them. But Snapchat's probably my main source of communication with them next to, Twitter would be probably second. Okay. Well, um, I'd be interested to know what the biggest challenge, this is one of the questions, the biggest challenge of recruiting top talent within the state of Kansas, but I'd like to twist it maybe, what are the opportunities for recruiting in the state of Kansas? Challenges and opportunities. Yeah, probably the greatest challenge is getting kids convinced to stay here. Uh, a lot of kids want to go out and see what else is out there. They've been here forever. They think it's bland. They think it's and they want to see what else is out there. Little do they know that this is probably the greatest place in the world because of the community and the people in it and the, the true college town feel. Now, convincing a guy who is from somewhere in Kansas and all he's interested in his uniforms, I mean, that's a little tough. But each, each recruit, in-state or out-of-state, you've got to find their niche or what makes them, you know, what, what will intrigue him the most? What do I need to do to entice him? Is it gear? Is it the community? Is it his major? Uh, so, and you're trying to figure that out in state or out of state. Um, but in state guys, I wish they really got a true feel for how special this is. And if we really locked it down, how great we could be, but there's still those guys that want to leave. And sometimes they come back and they realize, yeah, this is the best place. And, you know, some go and they succeed too. So um, it's fun. I, I truly enjoy recruiting Kansas kids because I was one my dad's coached uh, at Butler Community College for 41 years and I've watched them win with all Kansas offensive linemen all Kansas uh, linebackers and running backs when I was at Butler we had four in-state running backs that were all great and I think the year we won the big 12 or one of those years we had all in-state offensive line uh, this upcoming year we got a chance to do that again and the the effort and the attitude that some of them have and the desire to make K-State great is what makes it so important to them and to their families because they understand how great it is. And they also understand what it's like to be from here. I mean, when we leave here, we all hear the same remarks and the same thing of, oh, you're from Kansas. Well, what's there? What's that about? What's up there? And I think some of those kids hear that too. And that's why they leave. And some of them want to stay to make sure that, hey, you'll remember where we're from. And so I think, you know, you get the best of both worlds. Yeah, I think we both know K-State and the Manhattan community is a very special place. Oh, yes. Um, this isn't a question on here, but your dad has had a tremendous influence on your life. 
and I think he just got a recent honor. Would you like to maybe talk a little bit about your dad? He <laughs> plays such a big role in who you are today. Yeah, I guess uh, we're Tweedledee and Tweedledum. There's, we're, we're very much similar, and we're very much still 18 years old at heart. Uh, I've learned everything from him. I, I'm very blessed uh, to have such a good relationship and watch um, a coach care so much about his guys, be able to relate with his guys so well that it's pushed me to be that. Uh, I think it, it drives me to make the people in the state proud of me, but most importantly, my family and my dad too. Um, he's been a baller for 41 years. The only other place he coached at was Wichita State. And I've really learned that it's, it's not about the money. It's about doing it the right places for the right people and representing something that you truly care about. And that to me is, means more than any dollar sign you can offer. I mean, it's about, it's a bigger picture and it's a bigger thing. And I got to watch that firsthand as he's had job opportunities and things. And I've watched in this profession coaches be at, 14 different schools in 18 years and it's having a family now and we live less than a mile from the stadium that's how close we have to be and that's how close I have to be I think for my anxiety uh, but that's I'm very blessed also to have a wife that cares so much about K-State and she often shares her stories of when her family and then would drive to the games from Great Bend uh, together listen to the fight song and I spend every Saturday at a Butler game I didn't spend Saturdays um, at K-State games, but I always spent them in purple. So staying in this color meant a lot to me and being around uh, my in-laws my, my, and my wife who care so much for this university, I give my wife a lot of trouble because she lived in Marlatt Hall. Well, she hasn't moved very far away from Marlatt Hall. So she kind of came here and never left too. And it would be a goal of mine to, to represent this wonderful school and this wonderful community as long as I, I'm allowed to. Well, it's fun to watch a game with your wife. I had that opportunity at one of our away games. So she really gets into it. So um, we just had a question come in from the chat. What advice would you have for a small town Kansas athlete who might not get noticed by national recruiting services, but is interested in, in playing at a higher level? Yeah, well, right now is definitely unique and different for that. I try to tell guys email. You, if you email me, and you show an interest or you tell me where you're from, if you're a Kansas cat, I'm always going to respond. Um, but emailing is probably the most important thing that you can do right now. It's probably really the only thing you can do besides call uh, since camps were canceled. I tell young cats, go to camps. If you're good enough, your film will speak for itself. Have your coach reach out too is another way. Um, but, you know, to play at this level, it's, it's tough. And there's 85 total scholarships that you get. And, every position is basically a lot of a certain number and you're trying to find what will fit in that number. If you have, let's say there's eight defensive ends that you have scholarships and you graduate two, you're only going to take two in that class. So sometimes it could be the best kid in the world, but we don't have the spot because we're full or what not too. So there's a lot that goes into it, but I don't ever recommend recruiting services because I think that it's a waste of money. Um, if you're good enough, that sounds bad. If you're good enough, you'll get seen, but keep pushing yourself. Do drill tape. You know, a lot of guys right now are emailing drill tape to us, a uh, film of their height and weight to uh, prove that they're not wearing shoes or have them standing on the scale. Uh, that's another way. But I think just reaching out and making it a personal message, not a generic message that you're sending to everybody, but some thing like my parents are alums or something like that too. And but reach out to every school. I mean, reach out to Emporia State, reach out to Butler, reach out to Hayes. I mean, those places need players too. And it's, it's, it's hard to play at this level. And a very certain few do it. So, and it's even harder to play at the next level. We call the NFL, what the NFL means to us, it stands for not for long. So, <laughs> but it's, um, that would be the, my best advice would be to reach out to the schools that they are interested in the most and try to make it a personal deal and email, text or call however it is you can do it. So is there one position or a couple that are more difficult to recruit? Um, and if so, why? Probably corners and D tackles would be the toughest ones to recruit. Corners, it's hard to find true speed that can move and change directions the way they do. Uh, D tackles, it's hard to find big, big athletic bodies. Uh, what do we say? I, I love my alignment, but D tackles are just as big. But you try, You hope they're more athletic. So that's just a tough combination to put together to find. And 
it's it's a tough position to play. I mean, you got to be good with your hands, your feet. You you can't get down mentally too. Like if you're a corner, it's kind of like golf. If you're a corner and you have a bad shot in golf, you can't just go to the next shot and approach it with that mentality. If you're a corner and you give a ball up deep, you got to take that field again when your next opportunity is and compete. You can't let that bring you down. Um, it's it's uh it those two are the toughest two. Uh, the easiest, I don't really know if there's an easy one. Having Coach Klein here is really it helps uh, recruit quarterbacks. I really appreciate that. He is a uh, big time and an unbelievable wildcat and an unbelievable dude, and he he can he's a good recruiter. I'm really impressed with all of our coaches and how they hard they work and how much they care to be great and to be great for Coach Kleinman. It's really impressive. Well, could you maybe describe what happens? You land that recruit and you're all excited. How do you celebrate? Go Cats! Woo! I, if anybody's deaf, I apologize. As my wife would say, I'm the loudest human being. But uh, there's a lot of running around. Uh, Pre-COVID, we probably chest bumped. But post-COVID, not anymore. But uh, it's, it's a joy. It's excitement. It's happy. You're fired up for the kid. Um, and it, 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 it finally puts it all together and makes sense. When, when you get that committed guy, everybody is ecstatic. So and then on signing day, it's probably the most uh, relief because it's done they can commit until they and then they have to sign so even while they're committed doesn't mean that they will sign on signing day so signing day is probably the biggest joy or the biggest stress relief it's like uh, driving home from Lawrence with the win you know it's the stress relief uh, it's just that feel good because I'm taking that trophy to my house so and I actually can I actually have the other one right here sitting in my office so uh, you know I try to keep these things really close to me because they mean a lot so I don't know what I would do without it. It probably helps I'm on the board for the Kansas Sports Hall of Fame. So they haven't came to my office to take this yet since I'm on the board. They said I could have it here for as long as I'm on the board. So I'm going to stay on that board forever so I can keep this thing here. Well, and I would suggest to anybody that is on the chat that doesn't follow uh, Taylor on Facebook, be sure and check that out because he's got pictures in his home with his daughters with the trophy. So, yeah, well, we read that I'm a wild, I want to be a wildcat book and when we get to the uh, page where Willie's chucking all those opponents, they know they call them all yucky. So we're, we're raising them right. I promise you that. Well, I, I can understand that. I think my grandchildren are being raised the same way. So uh, we've got another question on the chat. Should college football players be paid? And do recruits talk about that in the recruiting process? Uh, it's not really a thing that's mentioned during recruiting, uh, paying them. Uh, that, that question's above me. I'm not smart enough to answer that. Again, I'm 18 mentally, so I don't know if they should be paid or not paid. Um, we talk about what they make, how much school costs, what, what the school's getting paid for. We do, we do describe that to them, how much they'll make a month on top of that. So we do all those little things, but it's not really a subject brought up. I, I try to stay away from money. I want kids to come here because they want to be here and they feel like they fit the system the best, and they feel like they love their coaches. If it became about money, I don't know where which route we would take. Um, maybe switching gears, let's look at like what uh, football practice looks like right now. I mean, I know they are got their helmets on with the shield, and when they're off. On yep, the when they're off, they put their masks on. Uh, they're masked up in the building. We ask them to be masked up whenever they're whenever – they're not a huddle, or if they go – if we break a huddle or we're done – they're walking by themselves you know we still want the mask on unless there's nobody by them then they can take it off i think we're on practice seven or eight uh, full contact now things are rolling well we're doing well we test every wednesday um it's it's been successful so we just hope and pray it keeps going that way um i wouldn't know what to do without a season and um it's already hard enough not being able to do what i do the best which is have kids come visit here uh, i feel like that's the best thing that we have and it's the greatest way to show them how special and unique this community is. And when kids can't visit, it does make it uh, extremely tough. But we're going to get through it. Okay. What's more difficult, landing a recruit or deciding which purple shoes to Whoa, wear? You know what? That's, we wanted you to talk about your shoes. All things that's, purple. <laughs> that's pretty tough. That is pretty tough. Uh, shoes definitely start the wardrobe. I think today I have purple Birkenstocks on. Nobody's seen that yet. I also have... A pair that no one's seen yet, but I'll show the uh, group. These are uh, a pair of shoes. 
uh, that I will have on eventually. But I have 41 pairs. I had to go around the house and uh, actually walk today and go down to my locker room, check under my desk, and I, I rambled up 41 pairs. I might still be missing one or two, so that should be 41, maybe 42. I do have more purple shares, shoes probably more than my wife even has shoes. But as uh, me and Amy already discussed, my wife will be totally okay with it, even though I've never told her the number. Um, I think I have 11 pairs of customized purple shoes. I think I added it all up. I saved it in my notes. I know I had six pairs of dress shoes, uh, any shoe as in Vans to cowboy boots. Even though Alan keeps giving me trouble about his purple boots are better than mine, I'm still waiting for him to get me a pair. Ten and a half, Alan. Don't forget. So, uh, but it's it's an ongoing deal. It's an ongoing deal. I have Vans. Anything I find purple shoes or people tweet at me, people text me. If there's some place and they see a pair, I tell them just get them and I'll pay you back. Um, it's definitely become a trend. I can't go around town without purple shoes on now. So I make sure I don't even leave the house. If I have slides on, they're purple. So I don't leave the house without purple shoes on. So why? Well, and I can't leave without a purple vehicle. So that's already a guarantee. So that's the fun part is, I guess, picking out which shoe to wear, which wardrobe. Do you have one pair of shoes that brings you luck in recruiting? Uh, I got some purple Jordans that I wear that are, my Jordan ones are pretty good. I have some other ones that have been pretty successful. But gosh, I wear so many different pairs. I don't know if any, I think when I got to actually go on the road in between the transition period, I got, I was on, able to go on the road. And I think when I was on the road, I had a, a different pair of shoes for every house I went into. So I had a bag just full of shoes or a suitcase just full of shoes. And my wife basically making fun of me as I'm leaving the door with two suitcases. And she's like, really? And I'm like, oh yeah, really? And I was going to places and kids are taking pictures of the shoes. So it's, it's sometimes some of the little fun things that you got to do and have fun with to make it work out. We have a, a question in the, uh, that was submitted earlier. Uh, this person lives down the road from your aunt in Coffeyville, Kansas. Uh, <laughs> and they're curious, what is the highest nationally ranked player that you have recruited? Uh, probably the one that's committed right now or gosh, you know, it'll be funny as some of the guys that aren't highly ranked that will be draft picks like uh, White Hubert, who was a okay. no star, who will probably have an opportunity to be unbelievable at the next level. Uh, Duke Shelley was another one. Um, Elijah Sullivan had Auburn. Will Jones, I mean, he had a lot of – Lance Robinson, I think, had 42 offers. Um, geez, it's hard to say, but those are some of them right there. Some of them I'm really proud of, too. I mean, some of them we had to work really hard to get. Coffeeville, Kansas with the shout-out. Uh-oh. Yes. Um, <laughs> we all know that K-State has had tremendous success with our walk-on program. How many – is there a number of walk-ons that you take each year? Does it vary? Um, just talk a little bit about the walk-on program. Yeah, the walk-on program is kind of like the scholarship program. If you have 85 guys on scholarship and you have a total roster of about 120 – six well then you're allotted that many walk-ons and each position has also a number so if i have eight scholarship dns we'll just go back to the dns you have eight scholarship dns you graduate two you have two you can put on scholarship but let's say i have a walk-on who left a walk-on who is graduated and then i have two open spots of that dn spot so the dn spot might be a total of 12 just throwing out a number um so you kind of get it depends on the year depends on how many guys you have and who stays who goes uh, some walk-ons succeed um and some they're they've had enough and just want to keep going to school or they've at least got to try to see what it was like at this level and um it's it, it is tough and our walk-on program is super important because we're not going to hit on every kid we sign and that's how we make up for it besides having quality walk-ons we always want to recruit kansas kids and we, i mean we'd love to offer everybody but we can't and that's why we've seen success from like guys like will geary who was a one-year walk-on put on scholarship uh, ryan mueller uh, Wesson Hebert, who was a gray shirt walk-on. So he walked on in the spring and he ended up being a team captain for us. Uh, it's probably one of my favorite stories. I mean, he was wanting so hard from Gossel, Kansas, an eight-man high school, and his dream was to play here. And he didn't give up on it. And he ended up being a team captain. Dalton Schoen's another one who's playing with the Chargers right now. Um, we call him, the holiday guys called him Jordy Nelson Jr. When Jordy came to speak, you know, we let him give Jordy some gear because 
everybody gives them so much trouble about being Jordy. But those are some of the quality walk-ons. Um, and those guys are just as important. And we try to treat every walk-on as a scholarship kid. To me, the, you got to keep them just like you got to keep everybody else. And you got to keep them happy and you got to love them up and treat them right. Uh, I don't want to put them in an opposite locker room or not get the gear. They deserve all that stuff because they're putting in all the work that everybody else is doing. Um, and some of them are working even harder. because Some of them just, this is their drink and they're chasing it down. So, yep. Well, I know a lot of our success stories have been when someone's come to K-State in a certain position and they just switch. Is there a secret to projecting different positions for incoming players, uh, like a wide receiver that you can switch to a cornerback? That's, a, that, that, that's not my question. That's somebody else's question. Yeah, uh, I think it's easy to project some linebackers to be DNs and some DNs to be D tackles because of the weight we're going to put on them during the transition. The transition, the hardest transition for a lot of these young cats is from high school to college, not college to NFL, because now they're on their own for the first time. They're eating three major meals every day. Uh, they're having to do all these things they never had to do and take care of their business. So that's, and the speed of the game is there. It's hard to coach big. So we like to recruit big. If you can get big, you can hopefully recruit them or coach them to be good players. And, uh, I was in speed. Speed is hard to find too. So if you find speed, you go on it and same with athletic ability. If you're a big athlete, there's a great chance. Uh, we can get a big athlete and bulk him up, put weight on him. If he can run and move, there's multiple positions he can play. Uh, Cody Suffelbean is a great example from McPherson, Kansas. We signed last year. He's here right now. He was a really big athlete. I mean, he had Wisconsin, Virginia Tech, and he still looks really good out there. And he's starting to figure it out. The game's slowing down for him. Um, and there's a bunch of others that I'm not naming, but I'm, I've been impressed with this freshman group that's been in here right now. And those are the big athletes that we need to get just because there is opportunities for them to play at different positions because of how big they are. And we can keep getting them bigger with our nutritionist, Scott Trout. She does an amazing job. Coach Chris Dawson, who uh, I always give Coach Dawson trouble because I tell him that he tries to help me beat my dad bod, but my dad bod's undefeated against Coach Dawson, so he hasn't been able to break that yet. But he does an unbelievable job getting these guys ready uh, in shape, uh, their strength numbers up, and get ready also for – there's two types of speed. There's testing speed and uh, game speed, and he, he's training them to, to be successful at both. So it's a, there's so many pieces that are put together to even, even for recruiting, let alone when guys are here. But you try to project guys that they're just going to get bigger. I mean, your biggest projection is, yeah, he's going to put on some weight and he's going to be this and this and this. Well, I know one thing that I noticed when we traveled together, I did not have a, a radar weather app and you do. And <laughs> now I have one on my phone, but talk about when you're out on the road recruiting. I mean, what goes through your mind? How many miles have you put on the Jeep? Um, <laughs> Just talk a little bit about just what it's like to be on the I've road. I've learned in my two weeks of recruiting on the road that you just, you get in your rental, you buy a case of water, a case of granola bars, and you just go and peanuts. And you just go, go, go. And then when you hit that hotel that night, you're out. And then you're up again as soon as you can be at a school. And some schools might be having 6 a.m. workouts. And our coaches go through it more than I get to because I've I only got to travel twice uh unfortunately i wish more it's too much fun being on the road selling the cats but uh it's it is a grind i i feel bad for some of the coaches because they are rolling and uh they call back here we kelly creer who's from cap claflin kansas she does a great job with aligning where they're staying what's next uh, here's your hotel here's all your stuff and they just basically arrive at the airport go in check up get their car they're out and we kind of set up a plan for them uh, i kind of help with the whole Kansas travel just because I think I've been in almost every city in the state I feel like I I, I started a golf county map and I think I've golfed in almost uh, 37 counties in the state so it's uh so I try to help especially new coaches with navigating through this through the state of Kansas and then most of them already know kind of where they're going to go when they land well, some one person asked about recruiting efforts in the greater Dallas-Fort Worth area. They want to know if there's anything that alumni are allowed to do to help when they notice a, a potential top recruit. Gosh, that's a tough one because I wouldn't know what to tell them to do because I would uh, have to call compliance first to double check. Fair enough. <laughs> so. I wish. I wish I had better. I, I wish you could help me. I would, I would take it in a heartbeat. <laughs> well, can we just tell them that they should um, – 
send an email to you. Yeah, shoot me an email. Tweet at kids. I mean, I don't even know if I'm supposed to say that. That's okay. Use Twitter. Make Twitter your friend. <laughs> um, someone wanted to know a little bit about, is there a, a lot of a difference on recruiting under Coach Kleiman versus Co Coach Snyder? Uh, I mean, yes and no. Uh, they're both super smart and intelligent. Coach Snyder is the man. Uh, Coach Kleiman um, wants to be involved a lot. Uh, so did Coach Snyder. I mean, they're both tremendous coaches and tremendous people. Um, I've had a ton of fun under both. I've really enjoyed Coach Kleiman. I mean, um, he's treated me unbelievable, but so did Coach Snyder. They're both really good. It's hard to compare. That's the question I hate the most because, you know, that's the hardest one to answer. They're both great coaches. I'm going to leave it at that. Go Cats. <laughs> that's, that's good. So um, here's a personal question. Where does all your energy come from, and did you pass it along to your daughters? I, I think my youngest might be, and I don't know what my third one is going to be. We're holding out. My wife's mad about it, but I told her if I'm going to have a boy, we got to hold out because if I find out now, I'm just like, oh, man. And when it's here, I it's all it's all over anyway. So um, I don't know. I only drink about a half cup of coffee a day. I was up this morning at uh, 5.15. I'll be up tomorrow morning at about 5.15. I'll go to bed probably about 10 o'clock. And uh, I do crash sometimes at the house. Sometimes I get to the house, I'm on the couch. Uh, but I go pretty easy. I've always had this ability. I don't know. I just – Roll with it, go. Game days are I'm, – I'm done on a Saturday night after a game. Those are the only things that truly crush me because uh, the recruiting prior to the game, you know, each game prior to COVID, I would have about three official visitors, one to three, and then unofficial visitors would be almost 50, and that's two parents each. And we do a program for them. I'm going to breakfast with the uh, cat that morning. So uh, I guess I just – I make up with my grinding, you know, for everything else. So you just got to be able to go and boost positive energy and roll with it. Now, your idea of relaxing may be different than some people's, but what do you do to relax? Uh, I like to play golf. I like to hang out uh, with in my neighborhood. I have an unbelievable neighborhood and my in-laws are phenomenal. And I'd really like just hanging out with my family. There's nothing more that I like better than just being uh, with my parents back home in Wichita or, uh, just hanging out with my in-laws playing golf. Uh, that's about it. I don't hunt or fish. I, I don't, I hunted once and that definitely wasn't, um, I'm a city kid and that probably helps me with my job, but uh, to, to relax, I'm just pretty chill. So as long as I can be with my family and friends, that's all I really like to do next to anything. But talking about the cats is kind of relaxing for me too. It's all good. <laughs> well, and um, tell us about your purple scooter. Well, my purple, yeah, my purple scooter, I got to get it right. You have it right, Amy. It is a scooter. I got in trouble because I kept calling it a moped, but it is a scooter. Uh, it was my grandfather's in Kansas City, and he was driving it through from Leewood to Heritage Park from uh, about 435 and, and uh, Mission all the way to Heritage Park. So we went up there, me and my dad confiscated it, and I've had it here for a while. And I finally, you know, COVID's done a lot for me. I finally mowed my own lawn since I've been married and uh, just cause I'm too busy, not cause I can't mow just cause I'm too busy, but I've, I've souped up the Jeep. I put purple headlights in, I put new fenders, bumpers, all that stuff. I did that all on my own. And then we took apart the moped and got it all painted purple with cats and power cats all over it. Uh, because if we can't have people or a uh, Harley day, I'm just going to take the moped around the stadium by myself since I'll have already be tested, good to go. I'll just cruise the moped single-handedly around the stadium down there for fun. And what have you missed most about not being able, you know, go on the Catbacker Tour this year? Uh, Man, all that free golf and hanging out and talking about the cats. That's the best. Uh, and the food, every place has a unique thing to eat mm -hmm. or a, a different item that they auction. And just hearing some of the stories or hearing about some of the people and when they graduated and what it was like and all those things like that are just fun to just build up and hear about every time. And every time you go, you meet somebody new. And the coolest part is we're all wearing purple and we all have the passion and desire for the same thing. It doesn't matter where we came from, what we do now or what we're doing. It's, it's the fact that we all love one thing and we get to talk about it. And that is probably my favorite part. Well, I, I know it's something we really all miss this year and we definitely can plan on driving out to garden city again. Um, well, driving out to garden city this coming year, um, 
uh, hopefully that will happen. Yes. It, it's fun to watch the alumni and the children all just react to you. I mean, you're someone that is very approachable and fun to, to be around. It's, it's fun. And it, they make it that way too, though. I mean, it's, and it, it go, goes back to being where you're from. And I think that's what makes Kansas and K-State so special is the people here care and they care about each other, even if they don't know each other. I mean, there's that, that desire and love for each other just because, you know, we've, uh, our state motto is unbelievable and it's so true, but we're all here for each other. And when we can lean on each other, especially right now, I mean, everybody wants to talk about how recruiting struggled and we're struggling to play football, but there's a lot bigger struggles going on. And I think Kansas people do an unbelievable job leaning on each other and helping each other and feeding each other full of positivity. And I, I tell all the guys all the time, the only way to beat COVID is with positivity. So let's fill it with that. Well, and I, I think um, one thing that's very special about the tour is the fact that you get to know the players. That's something I missed out on because when Wyatt, who does a, Wyatt Thompson does an incredible job interviewing. And, and then I look at the Alumni Association having the opportunity for Alan to work with athletics to help plan these events. Yeah. Uh, K-State's a special place and that doesn't happen at a lot of, uh, a lot of other locations, but um, we're just about out of time, but have you done, I have one question though. Have you done anything new or different during the pandemic when you were away from football that you never imagined you would do? Mowing the lawn, I can't be the Yeah, answer. mowing the lawn, I built a swing set. That was oh. a journey. Now, again, I, I relied heavily on my neighbors, heavily. Um, so I'm a, I'm a city slicker and a half. So uh, they definitely helped me not uh, have the swing set fall on the girls. So I did that. Uh, doing the Zooms is a whole new deal. I think that is for everybody. I'm sure everybody's tired of them, but uh, to me, it's just another avenue to communicate. And, and that's probably what I miss the most. I remember going to events in Wichita and coming back and I told my wife, I need to go to the Dillon's and she was like, I do Dillon's for. I said, I didn't talk to enough people today. So I need to go get that out of me. Um, so that's, that's the hardest part, but the funnest part is probably uh, building a stronger community within each other and being with my family more and that. And, uh, you know, trying to find new ways and be creative with uh, recruiting and selling K-State. Um, anything else you'd like to share um, before we? Uh, you know, everybody I know is struggling right now. And uh, I, I understand the pains and the feelings. I mean, I, I personally probably don't on some people's uh, parts, but uh, let's all stick together and keep being an unbelievable Wildcat family. And um, we appreciate your support and your care. Uh, we're, we're trying our best. I promise you that. And this place is full of great people and we want to keep building on it and um, go cats, go cats. I was too quiet. Yes. Woo. Go cats. Well, Taylor, we cannot thank you enough. You're an incredible graduate of Kansas state university. And we're so fortunate that you've been at K state for 15 years. And I know another probably 30 or 40 years. Um, I love it. I would love to see that happen. <laughs> and um, the recruits that you're in touch with and the, the current athletes, I mean, uh, we're truly blessed to have you at K-State. And um, I know that you're happy to, you know, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, you'll be more than happy to visit with them. Always, and, yep. Um, you need to keep sharing those purple shoes with us. Um, <laughs> but um, in closing, I just want to thank everybody for participating and watching today. It's really fun for us to be able to bring these special people to you to tell their story. And our next Wildcat Chat is going to feature the arts. And we will have Linda Duke, the director of the Beach Museum of Art and Todd Holmberg, the executive director of McCain and Jackie Harmon Bork, who is a former board chair is going to be the moderator for that uh, particular session. It's gonna take place on September 23rd at 4 p.m. And once again, thank you, Taylor and go Cats. Go Cats, woo! Taylor, you are